factors that was underpinned um, uh, global uh, financial markets since the turbulence earlier this year has been a recovery in commodity prices. And you can see that in this, in this chart. I'm not going to say a lot about that because time is short. Um, but, um, uh, you know, in the, in the early part of the year, there was really a lot of panic about commodity prices, about China's growth and its effect on commodity prices. And there's been considerable firming. And that's also a function of, you know, a number of other factors. But um, it's, it's notable and it has led to, uh, led to some stabilization. Um, the commodity price decline uh, has been a challenge again, for, many, for many emerging markets, especially the precipitous decline in energy um, starting in the fall of 20, 2014. But there are, of course, those countries of which India is, is a good example, which have um, uh, you know, actually benefited from, uh, from what has happened. Uh, you know, what, what I find interesting about this chart is the, the sort of timing of the terms of trade improvement that um, India sees after about 2011, and it's mirrored the opposite way for many other countries. You know, around 2011 is when China started easing out of its um, post-crisis stabilization phase, moving out of heavy construction and infrastructure. And you do see uh, a lot of commodities uh, plummeting uh, oil takes a little bit longer to come down sharply. Um, it does starting at the end of 2014 when growth prospects were sharply downgraded by the fund and others and when you know, that was basically, was basically a, uh, a price war looking back in, you know that. Uh, but again, these, these pressures have moderated a little bit. Um, and correspondingly, capital flows returned to some degree to emerging markets. Um, the white line uh, shows capital flows including China and the bars exclude China. Um, you know, the beginning of 2016, end of 2017, uh, sorry, end of 2015, a large part of the reversal of capital flows was actually the very large outflow from China that played an incredibly big role in uh, what was happening, but at the moment we seem to be seeing more risk on behavior with uh, not only the traditional FDI flows but also uh, portfolio flows in the back. Um, one chapter of the World Economic Outlook looks at the trade slowdown, which as you can see on the map is broad based. Um, and uh, even if you look across commodities, which is what the um, second graph does, uh, at a disaggregated level, the, uh, the uh, real import growth across different goods has shifted to the left in the entire distribution. And so trade has been growing less slowly than you know, global output for, for a while now, as opposed to the, the historical pattern. Um, the World Economic Outlook tried to look at this in some detail. And um, you know, what it found was that much of the slowdown is explained by slow growth of world demand, especially the very um, trade intensive investment component. Uh, is, there sorry, the is, is there really more uh, non oil or all the uh, it's, it's real goods, real merchandise, but it's. Uh, it includes oil? Um, I think it is manufacturing, uh, sorry, it's ma definitely manufacturing and services. Um, and my eyesight isn't good enough to do it for that. Um, I think we excluded commodities from, from this. Um, actually, I take that back. I think, we, I think we included commodities, but you know, it's real, so we adjusted for commodity prices. So it's really, you know, it's really everything everything here. Um, looking at that residual, um, the uh, residual is impossible to explain entirely, but two factors we found were significant 
were A, retraction of global value chains, and B, um, the, the decline in trade liberalization measures, and the actual uptake of protectionist measures that we've been seeing. Um, uh, the, the deceleration of tariff reductions uh, you know, throughout the world is you know, sort of well known and fairly obvious in these, um, in these graphs. Uh, but also there's been a uh, uptick in uh, protectionist pressures as measured by the Global Trade Alert. Now we still don't affect a huge percentage of trade in products, but certainly in some strategic areas, um, notably uh, things like steel where there's excess capacity, uh, other areas with excess capacity, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, temporary trade zones, uh, whereas Asia has much less targeted the rest of the world. Um, now, uh, there's been much discussion of whether you know, we should worry about a retreat from globalization and a resurgence of protectionism. And uh, just what is going, what is going on? You know, in, the, in the U.S., we've seen this uh, sudden outpouring of, uh, of anti-trade sentiment. Where does this come from? So I thought it'd be a little useful to, uh, and we may discuss this more also, to uh, look at uh, some data from the Pew survey on public perceptions of trade, and uh, sort of try to break it down a little bit. Um, generally, uh, well, these are data from 2014, uh, perceptions of whether trade is good or not, and good means very good or somewhat good, vary across, across countries. The average for uh, emerging countries in this sample is somewhat higher than in advanced countries. But notably, the, the, the uh, perception of trade is, is good. Uh, most people think it's very good or somewhat good. And uh, uh, this may have to do with um, you know, the consumer side. Do we as consumers benefit from, from trade? I think a lot of people recognize that they do. Uh, but there is variation across countries. And I sort of singled out um, India uh, among the emerging countries and the US. Um, uh, you know, in the U U.S., the, the, the perception of trade is, is very low compared to other advanced countries. Uh, Maybe because the U.S. is relatively closed, it's hard to say. And India, similarly, is, um, is a country where, you know, while three quarters of respondents say trade is good, it's lower than, the, lower than average. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, you know, uh, say a little bit more about that. Um, this sort of breaks it down by um, by um, uh, some selected Asian countries uh, uh, using the time series data. Uh, what's interesting, there are a couple of things that are interesting. Um, uh, Japan uh, is very low among Asian countries. Um, and India seems to have declined sharply for reasons that I have no insight into, but maybe uh, uh, people here can say whether they think that's a real thing or a uh, figment of the, uh, the polls. Uh, breaking it down a little bit more, I find this chart really interesting because this, this focus is not on trade, good or bad, but on effects on jobs and wages. And what you see in this chart is that um, there are a lot more countries uh, where a lot more people think that trade is bad for jobs and wages. Now, most of those countries are green, which means advanced countries. Emerging markets seem to, on the whole, uh, have a more favorable uh, view. And, uh, I think with that, that, that gives us a hint about what, what is sort of going on in the U.S. There is this perception that trade is a, is a job killer. And this was, um, <coughs> this was in 2014, spring of 2014. So um, um, the, the, you know, 10 
that's by the Obama administration <coughs> to sell TDP and to make the case that trade um, actually uh, creates high paying jobs and export sectors is not been terribly, terribly um, successful. Um, you know, in terms of the U.S. political dynamics, one I don't, I don't present here some other data we looked at, which is, um, you know, why it could be that you can see a sudden shift in trade perception. In the U.S., if you look at the polls of the Republican Party, which used to be a pro-trade party, most Republicans now say trade is bad. Uh, it turns out that if you look at things like the Gallup poll and ask people, what is, what is important to you? Trade is kind of at the bottom of the list. People don't really care much about it. Uh, you know, the economy is high, guns are higher, <laughs> um, a lot of things are higher. Um, and so we, we, we have a dynamic in the U.S. now where there's a you know, group of people who feel very intensely about trade and but, but are not going to abandon a party if that party switches its position on trade. And so the electoral competition for the anti-trade bloc is very strong. And so both major parties are now trade, which is not a good sign for the, uh, the uh, world economy. Um, I have some material on structural reforms from the April Leo, but uh, you know, we have other panelists on uh, last month discussion, so I'm going to skip over these and just say, look at the April 2016 World Economic Outlook. It's a great chapter. Um, and I'll just turn to, you know, just some sort of uh, policy conclusions um, uh, one important uh, message, especially for emerging markets, is the need for, and um, may need to be combined with supportive macro policies. And one of the things we're looking at in the fund is the sort of interplay between <coughs> structural reforms and fiscal support, and how that can be a very powerful uh, combination. Um, we're also um, doing a lot of soul searching about the globalization backlash, and uh, what to do about it, what kind of policies governments can, can adopt to, uh, to uh, promote globalization. And one conclusion, and this is also a conclusion about promoting growth, is the need to invest in education, uh, healthcare, um, other uh, social investments that are, that are quite important. Um, fiscal policy can play a role with structural reforms. It needs to be calibrated to where there's fiscal space. Um, financial sector in many, many countries needs strengthening. And um, exchange rate flexibility, we feel, remains key for um, absorbing shocks in emerging, in emerging markets. You know, at the global level, uh, we do think there's a need for a more comprehensive and, and coordinated policy push structural uh, fiscal uh, fronts, you know, with monetary policy broadly remaining accommodated in advanced economies. Uh, we think policymakers need to speak out about trade and its benefits and about the measures they can take to support um, uh, better redistributive policies without um, harming growth. And there's a large range of public good problems uh, that uh, beyond uh, pure economic management uh, that uh, the international community needs to address. Let me stop, stop there. Thank you, thank you, Marit, uh, for a detailed presentation. Uh, Ajit Ranade has, uh, will, will be the first person leaving amongst the panel, so I'll like to start with Ajit. There is a bit of time, so he'll be here with us for some time. Yeah, about uh, seven to ten minutes. Firstly, if you see, by the way, one trend of the IMF is, and this is just a general comment, is that uh, the year always begins with a set of forecasts, and every successive quarter, there's downgrade. But this is not just this year. It's been going on for the last three, four, or five years in a row. So the January, April, July, so it's a very consistent pattern. It's never, up, it's never not upbeat about the future, but then it's revised consistently down. Uh, so I wonder, you know, since this, adaptive expectations. So uh, five years in a row, perhaps we need to look at uh, why it is this, you know, this trend. Uh, it doesn't happen in India, though. The it's highest growth rate among the advanced economies or the large economies was the US, except for 2016, the UK was slightly ahead. 
Now, you know, this is an economy which is perhaps one-fourth uh, the size of the world economy. Or, I don't know, uh, maybe bigger. So that's a very significant fact that uh, despite the talk about global slowdown and concerns about growth, the largest economy in the world actually has the largest, highest growth rate among advanced economies. Um, may not be enough, but I think it's worth mentioning. Secondly, uh, the second largest economy in the world, which is now China, which of course has been slowing down, but the slowdown is is from 7.5 or 7 to 6.9, I thought I saw, and then maybe 6.6. So even that number is not something to despair. Of course, there are many other things, uh, uh, very big concerns about China's monetary easing, uh, China's uh, stock of large, uh, uh, what do you call them, I don't know, non-performing assets or doubtful assets in the banking system. So there are many other concerns, no doubt, but I think the two largest economies in the world have average growth rates of 2.2 to 2.4 for the US and perhaps 6.5, 6.8 for China because the, the numbers at least are uh, very different and for many other reasons as well. The, uh, the other, so that's the first point. The second point about China rebalancing, um, and there's actually there's five, I can think of five sort of dimensions of rebalancing. One is from um, exports towards uh, domestic economy. Second is from investment to consumption. Uh, third is from industry to services. Of course, this is a bit of a caricature, but uh, these are all different dimensions. Third is from industry to services. Uh, fourth is uh, from, I believe, public sector uh, being the main driver of growth to private sector public to private. And fifth, most importantly, uh, very important, is uh, from current to future. So much more stress on future generations, which means that greener growth, much more awareness about environmental concerns. China and the US together signed in Hangzhou, uh, the ratified the Paris Treaty. Uh, so that rebalancing actually should be seen, even though it might have some impact on current growth, it's actually a rebalance between current and future generations. Uh, and you, you see it in terms of close down, closing down of uh, coal-fired plants, um, uh, many other, even in textiles, many other policies which are discouraging uh, environmentally damaging technologies and uh, encouraging uh, renewables uh, and so on. So th I feel that um, that should be taken into account when we discuss uh, the China slowdown. And uh, that was the second point. Just a related point there is that you showed a slide on how economies depend on, uh, how the rest of the world depends on Chinese growth. And you mentioned uh, the fact that commodity prices seem to be influenced by Chinese demand, which is true actually. The, uh, the fact is uh, China has affected uh, the prices of a lot of uh, metals, especially base metals. I don't know if it affected the, uh, the, the whole phenomenon of <coughs> the drop in oil prices has anything to which China slowed down. Uh, I believe it was more because of the emergence of shale oil, not so much shale gas, and the fact that the U.S. is now perhaps the biggest energy producer in the world. That contributed much more to the steep fall in, in, in uh, energy prices or oil prices. Uh, unlike all other commodities, perhaps metal.